Hello, everyone, and welcome to Something to Talk About Live. My name is Liz Owen. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the Director of Communications at PFLAG National. It is great to have you with us today uh, for another exciting episode of Something to Talk About Live. Um, as always, I have with me my friend and colleague and the host of our show, our Director of Learning and Inclusion, Jean-Marie Nevetta. Hello, Liz Owen. Hello, Jean-Marie Nevetta. I'm always happy to see you. Um, this week, we're actually talking about a good reason to watch television, which makes me very excited. As a mother of two who is uh, who are spending endless amounts of time on television, I this this was one we watched together, which made me very happy. Oh, we're gonna have fun. I will see you later, Liz. See you later. Bye. Hey everybody, my name is Jean Marie Nevada. My pronouns are she and Aya, and I am the director of learning and inclusion at PFLAG National. Every single week we get together to talk about something related to LGBTQ equality and inclusion. And this week we are talking about trans inclusion and families and a pretty fabulous story. So first, things you need to know. Um, if you would like to read this week's articles that we are using for the conversation, I encourage you to check out straightforequality.org slash discussion series. Um, there you are going to find our primary article and our bonus read this week. So our primary article is on today.com by Carrie Breen, and it was what parents can learn from Sex in the City sequel talk about gender identity. For those of you who were looking for 2000s um, nostalgia and watching the show, you know that one of the characters um, was having a conversation about gender identity and expression um, with one of her um, children. But we also have a bonus read this week, which is related directly to the conversation that we are about to have. And that was in The Guardian. Adrian Horton did a great article um, that was entitled, It's Not Just About Being Trans. Always Jane is a moving, intimate portrait of late adolescence. And that is exactly who we are talking to. So I would like to bring in this week's guests, uh, Laura and Jane Nuri from Amazon's Always Jane. Hi. Hi. Jane and Laura, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm doing well. Um, as we were talking about earlier, I'm really, really glad that this is an all New Jersey show. Um, I feel there's like really good energy for us. So um, let's get started with the conversation. So um, the show is really amazing. Um, I always joke that I have a very short attention span, but honestly, it really kept my attention because I kept wanting to know what's going to happen next um, because the story was just so fascinating to me. So um, the article that we were looking at in The Guardian actually noted that the, sto the show started out as kind of a concept about affirming trans beauty, um, but it ended up being pretty much completely focused on your family and their story. So I want to hear from both of you, and Jane, maybe we can start with you. What has the effect of having your story told on such a massive scale um, been like, and what have you heard from people who have watched? Oh, my God. It has been such an incredible and eye-opening experience. I mean, if you told me two years ago that all this was going to be happening, I would have never believed it. But um, I am so grateful for all the opportunities that I've gotten from this and all the opportunities that I'm seeing other people get from watching it. And I am constantly getting messages thanking me and like supporting me and thanking me for the show. But, you know, in, in my mind, it's only just my story and I don't see there's anything to thank for. It's just, it's what it's just how our family is and it's what we know. So I think it's been so amazing to see everyone comment on it and, you know, support it and love the show. I think that's what we really wanted at the end of the day for everyone to just be able to sit back and watch a family and hear our story. But um, yeah, it's been a wild ride. It, it was, I have to admit, when you were sort of introducing your family in the first episode, I kept giggling. I'm like, yeah, if I could go through the camera, my daughter probably would sound like this too. And it was just very relatable and normal. Um, and I thought that was just, it was so easy to get into. So Laura, what about you? What has telling this story been like? Um, what have you been hearing from people? Well, um, to be honest, it's kind of fun coming home from Costco or the supermarket and saying that there's been a sighting and uh, but <laughs> having people coming up to us and thanking us. Um, but it has had an incredible response. Uh, emails, text messages, IMs from all over the world, to be honest. Uh, parents of trans children, trans teenagers, trans adults, just reaching out with support, sharing their personal journeys, um, and thanking us for sharing ours. Uh, it just people need to connect. And I, you know, I remember when we started our family transition, and that's what we call it. Um, 
after Jane came out, I, you know, I just needed to connect with that one person, you know, one parent who already went through this and, um, it can be very scary, overwhelming and a lonely road. Uh, and it, it was for me. So, um, that's why I wanted to do the film and to see that it is reaching so many people. It's just, it's a win-win and, um, you know, just to not only send our message that love and acceptance conquers all, but so that any struggling family knows that they're not alone. Yeah. And that it, and that even when people are struggling, it doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It's it's about working through it together. And I think that was kind of one of the really neat things in Emerge. So um, I want to talk about your own experiences and what this is like. So, you know, as PFLAG, we are always talking to parents about what that moment was when they first figured out or they first found out that something was maybe not what they had necessarily anticipated. So um, I want to start with your experiences, Laura. So could you talk about a little bit what it was like for you when you first talked to Jane about her gender identity? So for people who haven't seen um, the show yet, um, what was that like? And based on that experience, what would you say to other parents who are just getting this news for the first time? Oh, wow. Wow. Um... So I can, I'll start off um, giving you a little bit from the, the docu-series. So when we were in family therapy at the very beginning of Jane's transition and listening to other parents, a vivid memory of Jane came back to me. Uh, she was three years old and I caught her in her older sister, Emma's closet, wearing her velvet Christmas dress. And I asked her nicely, what are you doing? And she, um, and you could see, though, even she was like a little embarrassed. She and she said while touching the material in the velvet, she's like, it just feels so nice, you know. And, and so I told her, OK, you know, just hang it up when you're done. And, you know, what was I going to say? So I realized that this might be more than just dress up and uh, she needed to have the space to figure it out. And so the next time I found her on the floor wearing the same dress, uh, she was crying and I just said, what's wrong? And she said, and I remember this as clear as day, why did God make me a boy? I should have been a girl. So, uh, you know, that was, you know, it took, it took me by surprise. And uh, just without thinking twice, I said, God made you the perfect child for mommy and daddy. Oh, I'm going to cry. Oh. Always Jane team wins the money. I, I'm crying. <laughs> but I said, God always, uh, God made you the perfect child for mommy and daddy. No ma matter who you are or who you become or love, mommy and daddy will always love you forever. So um, to be honest, I didn't think of that, that moment in time uh, until I was sitting in a room with unaccepting parents. And that's when it hit me that Jane was suffering yeah. for all those years by herself. So, you know, 14 years later, you know, I'm realizing that all those years she was lost and alone. And so I made a promise to myself to move forward and not look back. And we wiped away the tears. Obviously we're still doing that and um, hit the reset button and Jack became Jane. So I would, I would say um, to parents, uh, I loved the article that you offered everyone, uh, the Kerry Breen article on today.com. Uh, what they say, affirm, listen respectfully, find out what your child wants, follow your child's lead, advocate, navigate, and protect. I think that's, that's if I had a bullet pointed list to look at every day, I think that's a perfect list. <laughs> you know, and I think it just starts with love your child. Um, and I think that it, yeah. for some people that doesn't come so easily, um, unfortunately. So Jane, this is about your family, but you're very much the storyteller throughout the series. So, you know, one of the interesting things, particularly in that article in The Guardian was you said, this is not just about being transgender. Could you talk a little bit about what you meant by that um, and, and what, what was going on. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I definitely said it in the documentary, but it wasn't just about me transitioning. It was about 
the love and acceptance of our family and how that helped me, how it helps my sisters today, how we are all a family union and how us being a family, we're there to support each other through and through anything. It doesn't matter that I'm trans. It, it's just a fact of like how we function it is that we're always there for each other and we're there to, to talk to each other, communicate and, you know, get through the hard times. Um, you know, filming this docu-series, you know, I was at a point in my life going into my senior year where I kind of had already accepted everything that I had been through. And I was kind of moving on from being trans, I guess, or the struggles that, that I was going through being trans. I was maturing more. I was realizing my, my own worth in a sense, because at such a young age coming out and not knowing anything, it was really hard navigating through high school and through my community and not really being able to talk to other trans girls who, because I didn't know any, like being able to navigate through that in my teens and going through a second puberty, it was a lot to handle. And I think the opportunity to start filming um, myself and my family came at a perfect time for us to really like sit back and really dive deep into what we all went through because I don't feel like we ever really got to sit down and really digest all the steps that we took and all the conversations that we had to get to where I am today and where my family's at today. So yeah, I mean, it, all in all, I think it just takes time with transitioning as well. And you, it takes patience and to have, to find your loving and supporting community and the people who care about you most to help you through those hard times. It's definitely. Yeah. So do you feel that film was, uh, this film was a good way to tell your story because you're saying it did kind of force you to go back a little bit and bring up some stuff that you had already kind of moved past. Did it feel like a comfortable way? Cause you, I, I was always interested in how conscious you were of the camera because you were also studying film and, um, was it a good medium for you? It was. I mean, I it before I even came out, I was a, a way for me to get out of my depression when I was in that state at, as a young boy, starting my preteens. A way for me to escape that was through film and through storytelling. And I think as I got older and was deciding to go to um, school, I wanted to go to a trade school and kind of immerse myself more in that as well as starting to transition. So I don't, I wasn't looking, I mean, I never really planned to have a documentary come out about our whole life and what we went through, but I think it was, I think we went in with the right intentions of what we wanted to tell with our stories. And, you know, we didn't have an agenda going into this. We really just wanted to show a loving and supporting family that, you know, like, because you really only hear when you look at social media and articles, you hear a lot of the bad from being trans and you see videos of trans women, black trans women being beaten or killed and it's terrifying. So, I mean, even people like Jazz Jennings who are trying to pave the way and trying to show a different version of that typical story, like it, it I think we really did our best to tell our story in that sense. But um, yeah, I, I'm very proud of what we accomplished. And, you know, I, I hope people enjoyed it or if they're not watching it yet or they haven't known, I hope they enjoy it now if they do watch it. And, you know, I can't really control anything else other than we went in with the best that we could do with it, so. Yeah. And it's it's just such a story. I think one of the things I found most interesting when it it wasn't just about you. And it just wasn't yeah. just about your experience. It was so very interconnected, which actually brings me to my next question for Laura. Um, you know, we often at PFLAG, we talk to a lot of parents who are coming to us and saying, my kid just told me that they are, you know, fill in the blank, they're trans, they're queer, they're gay, whatever. Um, and one of the challenges that they have and that we often hear, it's like the second question that you get is, how am I gonna tell other people? Um, and certainly this film has kind of been a very wide telling other people, but in the context of the show, um, your father is in it, um, Jane's grandfather. Um, and so um, talking to him about this was part of it. What advice would you give to other parents who are really harboring a lot of fear about, am I going to lose members of my family, members of my faith community, members of you know, the, the communities I occupy, who are really afraid to disclose this information? 
So uh, to the countless families who perhaps are on a similar journey or perhaps maybe deep in the trenches of bullying or struggling with acceptance, I urge patience, compassion, and support of your child. Uh, my husband, David, and I decided long ago that our child's happiness came first before anyone. So we were always prepared to cut ties with family or friends if they weren't aligned with Jane's happiness. Thankfully, that never happened. I would, you know, I would say to have faith in your circle of friends and family, if they truly love and respect you, your small circle of support will rise to the occasion every time and rally around you. And, and that's everything. So that is what we want to share. That's why we wanted to share Always Jane with the world. You know, since the day she came out, we stayed the course to Jane's happiness and truth, navigating through bathroom etiquette, locker room protocols, therapists, and endocrinologists, surgeons, medicines, uh, gender markers on legal documents, healthcare, teachers, guidance counselors, you name it. <laughs> <laughs> Just be patient listen to what your child is saying and doing, be plugged in and find the support and the resources you need. There is only one way to eat an elephant. My husband always says this and it always makes me laugh, but it's true. It's one bite at a time. It's overwhelming at first, daunting perhaps, and downright scary journey. But to witness your scared, meek, withdrawn child who is struggling and possibly suicidal, suddenly blossom and thrive when they are living their truth. Well, that's everything. And there's no turning back. And I'm not going to cry through that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should have done it like a by question. How many questions can Laura get through without crying? <laughs> Other than the whole thing, it felt more fair. Um, and Laura, I really, I, I really relate the way you frame that. And what would you say, just in your opinion, again, your sort of guidance on this, having gone through it, if parents are disclosing to family and friends and people are being resistant, so not outright hateful, not, you know, doing the you're going to go to hell in a handbasket kind of thing, but sort of that resistant. Um, and sometimes you get those really difficult questions. I know that, you know, we work with so many parents of trans youth and they are always, you know, people always tell us, people keep telling, asking my kid, how could they possibly know? So how did you handle stuff like that? Um, I, I had to find my patients and, um, and I had to understand that that person with the question is just asking a question because they're uneducated and they want to know. So, um, just be honest and say, let's sit down and have a talk and have that open conversation and don't be so defensive um, rather be compassionate and love and because that's show the compassion and love that you're showing your child to the people who are trying to understand. Um, and I think that's my biggest advice. Just, uh, just understand that they, they're trying to understand if they're having that conversation with you, they're trying to understand and it, and you might have to repeat it and repeat it again and again and again, Lord oh. knows Jane, had so much patience with us. I mean, Jack, Jane, Jack, Jane, Jack, 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 you know, she, we drove her nuts, but you know, it's, it is a process. And, um, I think you have to be forgiving and, um, just open your heart. But again, you know, if people are coming at you in a negative light and they're just, a lot of resistance, then I feel that you do have to make that choice. And I think the choice is always your child. Yeah. And Jane, on your side of things, um, I mean, it, it seems that as you were disclosing to different people, especially friends your age, it was a sort of different experience. You had a lot of friends who were surrounding you, who were supportive. Um, how did you handle that? Was it scary starting to disclose to people? Because I mean, the story kind of starts, you're already in the process. A lot of people already know. What was that like for you? Um, and and what was it like if you didn't get sort of that immediate support, the immediate validation that we all hope that we're going to get? <sighs> That's a hard question. I feel like, I think when I was younger, like first starting out, I was scared. I was terrified. I didn't, I wanted to be out, but I didn't want to deal with 
the circumstances of coming out. I, you know, and I, I really just had that mindset that, you know, like I am trans, but that doesn't matter. I'm just a girl. Like, like you don't have to ask me anything. Like you, you just have to say she, her, whatever. Like you don't have to ask me anything else, but people are curious and, you know, it just comes with it. It's, it's one of those things that you just have to rise above and keep your head up. And when you get down about things, when, like a couple days ago, I went to Home Depot and I was asking for help. And, you know, I probably didn't look my best. I was wearing like maybe a big coat and like a jacket and some rain boots and my hair was in a low pony. And the lady was like, I was like, thank you. Like, thank you for your help. And she said, no problem, sir. And I was like, oh, but it's like, <laughs> I'm at a point now in my life where I can laugh about it. And then I call my mom up right away and we're like, oh my God. <laughs> but it's, it's, not, it's not something when I hear it, it's not like I would have a mental breakdown. It's something I am now where I'm more content in my own skin that maybe she just was confused or maybe she didn't know, or maybe she didn't do any, like, that's what I'm assuming. I don't think she blatantly went out to call me. Sorry. Right. I think I was probably just like, I looked like a dude at that time, but that's fine. <laughs> so I think, you know, if you're not laughing, you're crying. So yes. I think, you know, take every day one at a time. It's being trans, being a human being is hard. So be easy on yourself. And, you know, I even get a lot of text messages saying how I'm so lucky because I came out early and which they're right. I, I do have that privilege of coming out early and being able to start my home hormones early. And, you know, I've known trans people who did come out and were rejected and weren't allowed to get on their hormones yet until they turned 18. And it's heartbreaking or when they do come out later in life and the from the puberty, there is some irreversible things that will not be fixed unless you have surgery. Yeah. But you know, that's their choice at the end of the road, but it, it, none of it, it's gonna be easy, but it's it's nothing that you can't get through. You know, it's interesting. I actually did wanna ask you about that. Do you think it has been easier, the fact that you were able to transition at such a young age um, versus doing it a bit later in life? Because now that you've sort of had the time to meet people probably along the age spectrum from really young, probably younger than you to considerably older. So you do feel like it was a real advantage, a real um, privilege to be able to do this? I do. I mean, a lot of people come out later in life or maybe they didn't have the chance to come out later in life because, yeah. you know, like the world was a different place a couple <laughs> years, many years ago. So I am lucky enough that I was born in this time as well. So it's like, it's just like so many different obstacles and like so many different situations. Like, of course, I'm very lucky. Do I wish I came out earlier? Of course. Maybe I wouldn't have went through all the trauma that I did at such a young age. But, you know, it's it's life. You know, you, yeah. you, you live and you learn, but it's about not giving up and pushing forward and fighting for what you believe in and what you love and to be happy. And I think that's the over one of the big messages overall with our show. So it's about resilience in the end. Yes, yes. I am I am applauding underneath the camera. Um Laura, you know, as you listen to Jane talk about this, I, I always think about, especially when I speak to parents um, of younger kids who are identifying as trans, um where, how did you even know where to start when you got this information? Because there are, especially with younger people, a lot of different issues going on um, because of their age, because of some medical choices that need to be made. How did you figure it out? Oh, well, I did. I felt like very alone at, at, in the beginning. And especially like where we live, you know, I, I just, I called my LGBTQ support. I, I went, I went straight to my cousins, uh, who were, um, who were living under the rainbow and very happily and accepted by the family and asked them for help and support and guidance. And they were lovely and helped me. And, um, I also leaned on the therapists for, uh, resources um, if I knew there were all these Facebook pages out there, I never even thought of it until recently. I'm like, oh my goodness, there's so many friends out there. So, <laughs> um, but 
there are so many resources out there, but you just have to look. And I guess I wasn't looking, but honestly, I, I heard about this one woman that was in town that had a trans daughter a couple of years older. And I just instant messaged her and asked for help. And she was a guiding light for me. And uh, yeah, so she helped me through a lot of uh, the questions, the answers, uh, what kind of doctors, uh, gender markers, all of the above she helped me with. And I'll always be grateful for that. But you just I, uh, have to take a look. Yeah, I think if you do, I actually remember I went to um, a conference for gender spectrum a few times. And one of the things that always sticks with me every time that I'm in that space is how happy both the parents are to suddenly have this other gaggle of other parents and realize they're not alone. Um, and then also the kids um, to realize that there's tons of other kids like them. And it is just, it's so, so refreshing because there is often so much bad news out there, yes. um, which then sort of brings me to a more, a, a kind of a challenging question, Jane. So you know, um, last year was an absolutely catastrophic year when it came to legislation that was created to directly harm people who are trans, people who are non-binary, and particularly young people. Um, so, I mean, you look at the headlines, you pay attention to the news. Frankly, there's not a lot of good news right now. Um, a lot of bad stuff is happening, a lot of pushback on really important progress. Um, and we know that constantly being subjected to this kind of news is not good for young people. It's not good for parents. It's not, especially not good for youth because you're constantly seeing who you are being attacked um, by leaders in many cases. So speaking from your perspective, um, what's it like to be young and constantly seeing this and realize this is kind of par for the course moving forward? And what would you say to other young people who maybe aren't quite in the supported um, space that you are in right now, having taken the journey that you would about how to be more resilient. That is a hard, that is a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. Like, I feel like I'm not even, sometimes I feel like I'm not even allowed to like give support because I, I, I was so lucky not to have to go through some of these hard, aspects of like not being able to play sports or not being able to use the right gendered bathroom or all these other things, not being able to write in, in your own school where you're really only there to learn and prosper and really further your knowledge and grow as a person. And it's like, if I'm speaking frankly, it's like, why does it matter? Like, why can't people just be happy? Let them, let them be who they want to be. Why are we holding them back? Why are we not letting them have these opportunities? If someone wants to be an athlete, let them be an athlete. Don't hold them back just because of what they didn't choose to be this and they didn't choose to be trans or whatever in their life. Like it was in this sense, like we're born this way. And, and I believe that truly. And I think it's, it's just not fair. And I, I would say to other trans youth who are going through those things where they can't play us in my instance, play on a soccer team on the right gendered soccer team or use the female bathroom. I think it's more dangerous to be letting trans women or trans boys use the gender bathroom that they were born with rather than letting them go to the one that they feel assigned. Yeah. Now. So I think people again, need to be more open-minded and consider everyone's feelings and safety, not just everyone else who people who don't understand and people who don't want to learn or have a, think of a stigma about it or whatever. It's, it's, it's not fair. And I mean, life's not fair, but in these situations, I think we need to rise above and go into this as adults and not hinder trans people or anyone for that matter and give them the resources they need. Yeah. Whether it's healthcare or school or whatever it is. Absolutely. Um, there's a lot of work to do, but I have to say it is programs like these, it is shows like yours, it is stories that people are hearing like this that I think suddenly make this real. It's not about someone else. 
It's about someone who you probably know. And it's like a family that you, that seems really relatable. So um, Laura and Jane, thank you so, so much. Um, for anyone who hasn't seen the show, please go to Amazon and check it out. You will so appreciate it. Um, I hope that we get to talk to you more because I have a feeling you probably have plenty more in store of what you are going to accomplish. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Jean Marie. So it was nice thank to you. Meet you. Well, that brings us to the end of another show. Um, that was a really good conversation, but they always are, aren't they? Um, I'm so glad that you're with us here today. Um, please check out those articles. Please check out the show and please be with us um, next week. Um, we're going to have a really, really fascinating conversation once again. Um, we wrap up the exact same way every single week, reminding you to run fast, laugh hard, and most of all, be kind. And if you have not done it yet, please get vaccinated. Please get your booster shots and please wear masks. I'm really, really tired of only seeing my friends on camera and I want to be able to get out there again. Um, so let's do the right thing. Thank you so much. If you need help before next week, go to pflag.org slash find to find your nearest chapter. I'm Jean Marie Nevada, and I will see you again next week. Thanks, everybody.